Before we dig into the details of muscle growth, it's important that you're aware of the different factors limiting hypertrophy. While we're all physiologically very similar, there are some differences that have a major role in determining your individual hypertrophy response. So I'm just going to read you this quote from Brad Schoenfeld because it's important that you understand what you see on Instagram versus real world hypertrophy expectations. Gaining muscle without using performance enhancing substances takes a significant amount of time and effort. Even with the most effective mass gaining training program in place, how much muscle an individual gains per month depends not only on the workout and diet plans, but also on gender and genetic predispositions for muscle gain. While you may see noticeable differences after your first month of training, for most people, substantial results will take months or even years. So prior to setting any goals or starting a program, it's important that you are informed of the different governing factors affecting individual hypertrophy development. And these factors include, number one, genetics, number two, age, number three, sex or gender, and number four, your current physical condition. Now, an upper limit to muscle fiber size exists, which is ultimately determined by a person's genotype and phenotype. Genotype is loosely defined as the genetic makeup of an organism. Or another way of putting it is that genotype simply means your genetic code. Whereas phenotype refers to how genotypes are expressed. So genetically coded information, being your genotype, is interpreted and then applied to create your phenotype. So another way of looking at this would be with respect to hypertrophy, someone may have the genetic makeup to become an elite level bodybuilder. But if they never engage in resistance training, that genotype will not be expressed to bring out the championship caliber physique. So in several studies performed with large multitudes of subjects, we've seen a, a varied hypertrophy response to resistance training. Often, the best performing portion of the group sees a solid hypertrophy result, while the worst performing sees little to no hypertrophy. And Findings like these have led to subjects often being classified as responders or non-responders to resistance training. Now, the term responders and non-responders have been proposed in literature. Even non-responders, however, can still increase muscle mass over baseline levels. They just may require longer periods of, consistent, tra of consistent training and possibly alternative training strategies to gain additional hypertrophy. Also, the research suggests that genetics contributes less to muscular development with advanced aging. Aging has a very significant role in hypertrophy. The aging process is associated with changes in both quantity and quality of muscle. Prior to the age of 20, the body is still maturing and hasn't really leveled out yet. So the opportunity for hypertrophy is present, but it continually increases with age, and it begins to drastically accelerate after the age of puberty. The optimal zone for hypertrophy, or as I like to call it, the hypertrophy window, reaches its peak levels between the ages of 20 and 40. Then, in your 40s, the average person loses approximately half a percent of their muscle mass per year. And the decade following, ages 50 to 60, the average muscle loss increases to about 1 to 2 percent annually. And anything after the age of 60, it again starts to dramatically accelerate to roughly 3 percent per year and sometimes greater with an activity. And this age-related loss of muscle tissue is referred to as sarcopenia. The good news, however, is that by adding plenty of protein to your diet, staying active, and strength training on a regular basis, 
you can not only increase strength and the functional ability to contribute to quality of life, but also slow the loss of muscle. If you look at this graph, there is a section labeled disability threshold. One of the harsh realities of aging is that most people at some point or another are considered disabled simply because they do not have the strength to perform daily tasks. And this clearly depicts the significance of maintaining muscle mass as we age. Now, fairly meaningful differences exist pertaining to the maintenance and hypertrophy of muscle tissue when we are comparing genders. On average, women have less muscle mass than men from both a total or absolute standpoint as well as a relative standpoint. And these discrepancies become very obvious during puberty and persist through old age and have become largely attributed to testosterone levels. And aging appears to have a much greater detrimental effect on muscle mass in women because their muscle loss seems to accelerate much quicker than men. There are a few reasons for this. The first is that elderly women experience increased rates of protein breakdown. And this is because of their decreased estrogen levels and possibly testosterone production. The second is that protein synthesis seems to be less responsive from exercise. And this combination of increased protein breakdown with impaired protein synthesis causes women to lose muscle mass at a much greater rate than men. Now, despite these obstacles, elderly women can still increase muscle mass with regular resistance training. And this is why strength training is so important for women. And the final factor influencing hypertrophy is your current physical condition, or another way of stating it is your current strength training level, either beginner, intermediate, or advanced. One major issue with hypertrophy studies is that the vast majority of them are carried out on untrained people. And this is generally done for the sake of convenience because the pool of untrained subjects is so much larger and easier to draw from than the pool of resistance trained subjects. And you can imagine how much smaller the pool gets as you require more experienced lifters. This brings me to a very important point. The hypertrophy response of trained subjects is substantially different than that of untrained subjects. And this significantly limits the usable data from trainees beyond the initial stages of training. As mentioned in the genetic section, we all have a genetic hypertrophy ceiling and many of the potential differences we see between trained and untrained people could be from a phenomenon known as the ceiling effect. During the initial stages of training, the neuromuscular system is totally deconditioned and responds to virtually any stimulus because the ceiling for growth or the, the window of adaptation is just so immense. To the point where even steady state cardio has been shown to produce hypertrophy in subjects who were previously sedentary. Now, as people move closer to their genetic ceiling, it becomes progressively more difficult to increase muscular size because the window of adaptation becomes so much smaller. Theoretically, this is because an excess of muscle would be energetically inefficient. It would simply require far too much energy to maintain. And therefore, the body limits the amount of muscle that we can gain. So for example, some research shows that in highly competitive bodybuilders, the extent of hypertrophy over a five-month period is relatively small. 
about 3 to 7 percent. And this would suggest that these people are nearing their upper limits of their genetic ceiling. As people become resistance trained and move closer to their genetic ceiling, it becomes progressively more difficult to increase muscular size. And any meaningful hypertrophy response can be gained by precise manipulation of training variables, including strategic brief periods of deloading to restore the anabolic responsiveness of trained muscle. Because it becomes so much harder to gain muscle as you approach your genetic ceiling, it's more and more important for trainees to strategically manipulate their training variables. So I want to leave you with some reasonable expectations in regards to hypertrophy training. So first, men in their initial month one to six can expect to gain two and a half pounds per month. And then in month seven to 36, they can expect to gain one pound per month. And anything beyond month 36, it seems to be closer to about half a pound per month. With females, the initial months one through six, they can expect to gain one and a quarter pound per month. And then months seven through 36, roughly half a pound per month. And month 36 and beyond, about a quarter pound per month. These numbers are based off of possible averages of people between the ages of 20 to 40 whom adhere to the guidelines recommended in this course. I hope it's obvious that if you omit important aspects of hypertrophy, like nutrition or training frequency, that these numbers aren't totally accurate. And this is why it's important you set SMART goals. SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Realistic, and Timely Goals. Therefore, if you plan on embarking on a hypertrophy journey, it's so important that your commitment and your plan are in line with your expectations.